Well, it looks like everyone's sitting comfortably, so uh, we'll begin. Uh, kia ora koutou, hi uh, I'm Peter Thompson, I'm the Chair of the Better Public Media Trust, and it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce this special panel event uh, featuring uh, Honourable Claire Curran, who's the Labour Minister for Broadcasting, Communications and Digital Media, also Minister for Government Digital Services, Associate Minister for ACC and of State Services and Open Government. Uh, Claire's uh, also the Labour MP for Dunedin South, has been since 2008, and has had a long career in, in journalism. Um, also welcoming uh, Paul Thompson, who I'm sure won't need an introduction either, as uh, the Chief Executive Officer and Editor-in-Chief at Radio New Zealand, has been since June uh, 2013. Paul, of course, has overseen a number of initiatives, uh, notably the development of RNZ's digital presence and including ex expansion into new services such as the wireless. Um, Paul was previously at Fairfax for about 18 years. He was the group executive editor at Fairfax New Zealand and Fairfax Media Limited. And prior to that, he was editor of the press, uh, during which time it was twice named uh, New Zealand Newspaper of the Year. Prior to that, he was also editor of the Nelson Mail. So we have two very distinguished speakers. Please give them a very, very warm welcome. Now, the way this will go, I'll, I'll invite Claire to speak first, followed by Paul, uh, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, I'll put some ground rules out for the question and answer session. It would be good if you could, uh, first of all, ask questions. If you want to make a comment, please make it to the point and not go on a rant. Um, and we'll, we'll, there, there is one house rule here. It's, uh, it is a public meeting. Um, but given the intense and, and occasionally vociferous and, and occasionally vicious media coverage of the Carol Hirschfeld issue, we're not having questions on that topic. So we'll stick to public, pu public media policy issues, please. Okay. So with that said, uh, Claire, please take the floor. Thank you very much. So kia ora koto, everyone. Are you all right if I sit? Yes. Um, and talk to you. Um, I'm not going to talk for too long um, initially because uh, I'm hoping that we can have a good conversation and discussion and I am open and willing um, and keen to do that and to take questions. Um, the last time I was in this room was, hmm, I think it was probably about two and a half, maybe three years ago and it was to hold a, uh, a forum, an informal forum, uh, on public broadcasting. And it was in my role as oppos opposition spokesperson for broadcasting. And, uh, and one of the people who attended the forum that day was David Beetson and Leslie. So, um, and it was a really interesting discussion. It helped uh, form the policy that the Labour Party took into the election last year. Uh, I did a number of those forums around the country and they really did help inform the discussion. And I really also want to acknowledge uh, the um, Better Public Media Trust and or the Coalition for Better Broadcasting and whatever other names you've had over, over the last few years because you've also really helped inform the public discussion on these matters and inform the policy that, um, that the Labour Party took into the election last year. Uh, and formally acknowledge uh, you, Jeff, for your speech, which I didn't hear, but I'm, um, I'm really hoping to get a copy of it soon because I really do want to acknowledge David Beetson's significant contribution to media in New Zealand. Uh, not only to media in New Zealand though, but to me personally. Uh, I consider David a friend, um, a bit of a mentor, and certainly a font of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and I attended his funeral on the 27th, I think it was, of September uh, in Auckland. During that limbo period, when uh, uh, between the election and the announcement of a new government, so it was sort of very, all very up in the air at that time. Um, and I, f I feel very sorry that he isn't here um, to offer his wisdom and perspective during the, this really exciting 
um, challenging and somewhat difficult time um, for but but it is really exciting for the future of media in New Zealand so I am I don't think it would be a surprise to anyone in this room uh, that I am and always have been a firm believer in the value of independent public media uh, both as a means of holding our institutions to account uh, and for its contribution to national identity. Media is an absolute integral part of our culture, of a country's culture, of its sense of place and purpose and not only in an historical sense of recording of the important moments of the day, but as a driver of public participation and discussion and debate and the enriching of culture. Um, it's absolutely vital that we see and hear ourselves and our stories reflected in our audiovisual content across media platforms, having the right content for a resilient and sustainable New Zealand broadcasting system, which is really crucial uh, to a strong, <coughs> modern democracy. New Zealand, um, so the government, this government, which has been around for six months, um, which isn't a long time, we've got an ambitious work program in the public media space. We want to ensure that any investment in public media is sustainable, produces high quality, diverse content, and it's also important that this content is accessible for all New Zealanders. My focus right now to kick this off is on transforming RNZ into RNZ Plus, a truly multimedia platform provider dedicated to quality New Zealand programming and journalism, to expand the funding um, for New Zealand On Air as the provider of quality content, publicly funded content on other media platforms, to take another look at how New Zealand On Air does that, but to, to ensure that New Zealand On Air and the work that it does has an important role to play in our expanding investment and emphasis on public media in New Zealand. Um, the creation of RNZ, or the of evolution, as I call it, from RNZ to RNZ Plus, is a significant thing. It's the most significant um, discussion and intent by a government in decades uh, for public media. Of course, it hasn't happened yet, and it's still a lot of talk, um, and it's creating a lot of discussion and controversy, but it is the most significant discussion that we've had about public media in decades, in my view. Um, and that investment into quality and voice of independent public media is aimed to support greater diversity of New Zealand stories. Um, and I know that you're going to ask me, and so I'm going to put the record straight here at the moment. So how much will that significant investment be? Um, I can't answer that here today, so you can try all you like. Um, I can't answer that here today. Um, and that, and where's Miles? Um, partly the timing of when you ha happened to have your AGM, and of course you had to have your AGM. But, um, but we've also got a budget coming up, and, and, and that hasn't happened yet. So I'm sure you know, you're all sensible enough to know that. Um, I wish I could answer that um, because I know that you, I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room is a passionate supporter of public interest media and of RNZ and of the fact that we need more public interest media. But the reality is I can't even give you a hint of what might be coming up in the budget um, because that is the um, sworn to secrecy um, fact of the matter that all myself and my colleagues are under. But 
I would emphasise that this government remains committed to transforming RNZ into RNZ Plus as a truly multimedia, multi-platform entity. Um, moving RNZ's platforms so that they are up multimedia will be a gradual po process. It can't just happen overnight. It can't, that evolution is not going to be instant. It will take some time. It will be depend dependent on funding. The long-term goal is that RNZ Plus will include a free-to-air non-commercial television service. Right. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but I hope you did hear the beginning of that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the long-term goal. As I said, this just doesn't happen overnight. Um, I'm sure Paul will be pleased to hear that. <laughs> um, New Zealand's level of public media funding is low. You all know this compared to every other OECD country, we're almost at the bottom in terms of the amount per head, per capita that we spend on public interest media. It's a shame, it's more than a shame, it's an outrage, and it's affected us as a country, as a nation. Um, and um, and the um, contribution of public and private media to supporting an informed democracy is not as strong as it should be. Um, my focus on expanding RNZ into RNZ Plus and increasing funding for New Zealand On Air will strengthen uh, New Zealand's public media system. So, and I, I know there hasn't been a lot of discussion about this, but this is also integral to the plan. It's integral for resilience, it's integral for the sustainability of what this government wants to do. So we have, I've, and as the first step of this, I've established a ministerial advisory group to investigate the establishment of a public media funding commission. The commission is aimed to be an independent, non-political voice advising myself as minister, advising the government, but importantly, advising parliament on the state of the media and the re resourcing needs of public media agencies. There is nothing in New Zealand um, currently that goes anywhere near to doing that. And I don't want to, by saying that, diminish the contribution of um, the amazing academics that we have in this country beavering away in the universities trying to provide some critical analysis of this space. But we have nothing, we have no established entity that looks at this as being important, acknowledged, valuable. Um, and it's time we did. And if we had that, we would have the ability to have a sanctioned voice that is um, that, it, that provides that analysis, that provides the advice, provides the um, important information about the critical nature of public media, of the public media space um, to us as a nation. Um, so that's what, so this is again early steps. And the ministerial advisory group is yet to give me the advice on, um, on the next steps for uh, our, our plan for RNZ Plus and for NZ On Air and for the formation of a, uh, a permanent entity, the Public Media um, Funding Commission. <laughs> um, so um, that is coming. The members of that group are may be well known to you. They include Michael Stiasny, Sandy Beatty, Josh Easby and Irene Gardner. Together they offer considerable governance, public sector and broadcasting experience. There are gaps. I acknowledge that there are gaps. But it's the beginning. And there is a broader plan that is coming. Um, I look forward to receiving their advice on the establishment, as I've said, of the Permanent Public Media Funding Commission and the functions, role and scope that such a body would have. And I welcome your feedback today and ongoing uh, and your continued support for building strong, resilient public media. And I'm happy to take questions after Paul's spoken. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Kia ora koutou. Great to be here. Um, my thanks to Miles for the invitation. Um, it's a really important meeting, I think. We're at a crucial time 
in terms of the strength of our public service media and for RNZ at the moment. So I feel uh, that I'm among kindred spirits. Um, so my deep thanks for being here today on a Sunday afternoon. Um, thanks also to the Minister. Um, the policy is bold and it is a very positive policy, policy for RNZ. I think it's really refreshing to see a political party emphasise the importance of strong public service media in building a stronger democracy and a clearer sense of national identity. I think the policy also shows an awareness of the challenges that the commercial media sector faces at the moment and the fact that a sustainable, diverse and independent news media is an absolute must for any democracy, but it's actually not guaranteed. It, doesn't, it won't just happen, it won't just be created just by some automatic process. We've all got to do our bit to build it and I think the policy really supports that. I'm also really pleased, clearly, that a bigger, stronger, more multimedia RNZ is at the absolute heart of the policy. Um, RNZ has kept the flame of public, commercial free public service broadcasting burning in New Zealand. Yeah, at times it's been... You know, at times the flame has flickered a bit and it's been trimmed down. Um, we're going okay at the moment and we feel pretty good, but we could do a whole lot more. We could do a whole lot more, so I really welcome that policy. Uh, in terms of where RNZ is at, I mean, our job is to be that trusted, essential, commercial-free, independent voice for New Zealand and the Pacific. We're all about building a connected and informed Aotearoa and relating to people as citizens in a democracy, not as consumers or advertising data. Um, so we have a really clear sense of what makes us unique. We have a lot of respect for our colleagues in the commercial sector and we want to work with them, but what we do is very different. As an organisation, we're in the middle of a transformation towards being a multimedia organisation. And that's all about being there where audiences want us to be in the way that audiences want us to be. So that multimedia transformation is well underway. We've got a long way to go, but it is working. And that's about being strong on air and with live broadcast. It's being strong online. You can listen, watch, read us, you can share our con content, and we strike up partnerships with commercial media so that our great and unique content gets on their platforms into more people in that way. We're all about being informed by audiences, not by our own thinking or, or preconceptions. And we're definitely the biggest driver that we have is not just to grow our audience reach, although we're doing that really successfully, but it's actually to grow the diversity of those audiences. There's big parts of, of the New Zealand community that we aren't closely relating to at the moment. And if I'm excited about anything about the next five years in terms of what greater investment in us will achieve, it is that we'll be connecting more with young people, with Māori, with Pacifica and with new New Zealanders. Those are the groups we need to become more relevant to. Our, our independence is absolutely our lifeblood. Uh, we fiercely guard it. Um, it's baked into the organisation um, and it's something which is such an intrinsic part of it. My job really is just to keep out of their way and that's such a powerful thing. We don't have to go and talk about this. Um, and linked to that is that you, we are there when you need us and it's just another strand of discussion I think in the debate around investment in public service media. It's no good realising when the volcano goes up in Auckland in 30 years' time or when the big earthquake hits Christchurch again or heaven forbid in Wellington. It's no good figuring out at that time that the country should have been investing in a really strong, resilient public broadcaster. Now's the time you need to do it because we will be there as a source of credible information at the exact moment when New Zealanders need us most. Um, our strategy is multimedia. It is about public services, about commercial free and it's working. And I think RNZ Plus is a golden opportunity to put our plan on steroids. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, the commercial media sector's got some real headwinds, and I don't think they're going to ease anytime soon. The business model around advertising, and even to an extent around paying for content, they're fairly challenged. There are these large tech titans like Apple and Google and Facebook and Netflix and Amazon who 
have all the money, all the engineering power, and they are calling all the shots in terms of the development of future media. It's really difficult in a market the size of New Zealand, you know, roughly five million people on a good day perhaps, to think about how we can avoid becoming content tenants in our own land. The commercial market still has life in it, but it's not, a, it's not an easy story for them. And I just want to end by saying that this investment in RNZ and in public media across the whole, it's actually a vital interest of national sovereignty. We won't be able to control our future in, the, in this age of lies and propaganda and that awful phrase, fake news, unless we can resource our own stories for New Zealanders. So that's what RNZ is all about and really pleased to take your questions today. Okay, well, thank you very much to both Paul and Claire. Uh, the floor is open. Uh, question over here, Karen. Minister, I'm a little confused. You've said today that um, it will include free to air television service, RNZ Plus. On the 4th of 13th of December, you wrote to me, Hi, Karen, who is the David you refer to, which was David Beetson, and I have never proposed building a TV station. I think there is a lot of misinformation being circulated. I'm confused. Uh, well, I've never proposed building a free-to-air television station. And as I've said, right from the very beginning, this is an evolution um, from, at the moment, RNZ pro uh, provides uh, very high-quality radio, um, digital, and a small amount of audio-visual content. The idea is to build that and to build out from that and, uh, and that, in the longer term, as I've said, we will be looking at um, ensuring that that includes a free-to-air linear um, television. The cost of that infrastructure, which is already being looked after by TVNZ, surely it's, it makes more sense to enforce with TVNZ as New Zealand shareholders of that institution, <coughs> its obligations to the public rather than reinventing the wheel through another media. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you for your opinion. Um, and, and I've also said that a conversation around TDNZ's future is, um, is starting to occur and will be occurring um, uh, and continuing to occur. We are looking right across the media <coughs> spectrum. But we are in an environment where we have um, where, which is a digital age and where, where, where convergence has occurred and where there are possibilities in the future. Um, like I said, I'm not getting too specific about that right now. I have given those commitments. Um, we are talking about an evolution. We're saying it's not all going to happen at once. But we are giving you a direction of travel, which I think is pretty important and pretty exciting for New Zealand. I promise it's my last comment, oh. but New Zealand on the air desperately needs additional funding, and it's yet there's been no commitment to give how much of that 38 million is to New Zealand on air, when that is the non-partisan existing model that works really well to make sure there is a diverse amount of stories and um, culture shown on our screens. Yeah, and again, thank you for that. I think there's no doubt that there is uh, a, a, a significant deficit in New Zealand mm. made content in New Zealand generally across the board, which is why there has been a commitment to the New Zealand on air model along with an evolution of RNZ to RNZ plus. It's not an either or. Okay. Next question please. Could, I, front. Peter, could I just, oh, sorry, just to come uh, um, perhaps provide RNZ's perspective on on the television component of the policy. Um, we looked at very carefully in terms of the business case that we're presenting to the government and we can see that 86% um, of people still watch television each week in New Zealand, an average of three hours a day. So our perspective on that is that if given the right level of investment, we definitely would want to do something to look after those people on that platform. We didn't see it as necessarily the first thing we would do or uh, the entire policy being reflected around that, but we absolutely see an opportunity there if we're given the right level of investment. And our perspective on it has been to look at whether the audience would value us being there and whether it would be something that they would like and use. 
And we think probably it would be. Um, I'm heartened to hear that it's not an immediate expectation. It would take time if we travel in that piece. But we certainly have an openness to that, and our plans reflect that. Uh, but the point I would make is one thing that we think is absolutely essential for us is high quality news, current affairs, and entertainment video, which could appear on any platform, whether that's on your big TV set, on demand, or live in your living room, or on your mobile phone, or on, or on your, your grandkids' um, tablet. So we're very interested as a priority in high quality video storytelling. Sorry, question at the front. Yes, thank you, Kia ora, Claire. Um, it's really refreshing to have this whole change of attitude toward public broadcasting, and so thank you for bringing that. Um, I'm going to speak um, on behalf of the community access sector, because that's somewhere that I um, am involved in. Um, and uh, two points to make. One, please include that in your strategy and investment because the, the wonderful thing about community access radio is that it's actually telling local communities, giving them access to media and, and um, you know, giving people access to local stuff. Um, and I'm very interested in, in your comments on diversity because um, in Hamilton we've just started um, linking into Radio New Zealand News on our station. Um, but also, we have a lot of those diverse stories, and so it would actually be really useful. I mean, I'd love to connect with you myself to um, to talk about, you know, how how we could work together around some of that stuff and getting um, those stories shared better. Well, I, I think we've probably both got responses to that, but um, just around community access radio um, in my own community in Dunedin, it plays an important role. Um, it's a way of grassroots organisations having their voices heard and mostly tends to run on the spell of an oily rag um, and very conscious of that. Like I say, there is a huge deficit um, out there in our community across New Zealand um, for how we actually express diversity through our media. Um, in, the, in what I have said, to um, RNZ and to NZ on air to date. I've talked about the importance of um, uh, regional, the importance of Māori and Pacific and other ethnicities, um, the importance of people with disabilities who are able or not able to, uh, to access media. Uh, currently we've got 800,000 New Zealanders who have a hearing disability of which around 400,000, so that's half of them, uh, really struggle to access media, to access news and current affairs, to access the other content in the way that uh, other New Zealanders do. Um, we have around half a million people who are sight impaired um, who have difficulty in accessing um, and participating in what should be available to all. We have. Um, among the lowest levels, again, in the OECD of captioning um, and audio description of any other country, which is absolutely shameful. Um, we have these deficits. Uh, children, our children, the amount of investment in, uh, in content, New Zealand made content for children, is very small. New Zealand On Air is doing work in that space. Um, and, and is making um, is making inroads, but it could be a lot more. And the children are children are um, uh, as somebody said to me the other day, children are not a genre. <laughs> <laughs> Just as older people are not a genre, um, children are part of our community. Um, and there are small children, there are medium-sized children, and there are larger children. Um, and and we are not making enough content. Where, where, they, uh, where they get their information from, where they get their sense of identity from, is often not New Zealand. Um, this, is a, this is something that has to change. So um, I, I feel very strongly about this. The government feels very strongly about this. We have to make change. Um, and it has to be, new, and we, we, so we need more New Zealand content on many platforms, but we're, you know, we have to. We need a strategy, RNZ, um, evolving to RNZ Plus, and expanding the reach of 
New Zealand on Air is the, is the basis of that strategy um, to kick things off. Uh, look, great to hear that you're using our news bulletins, that's fantastic. Um, happy to have a chat with you afterwards if you'd like, give me your contact details. But just broadly, one of the things we've done in the last few years, which um, perhaps hasn't had a lot of public attention, is the number of content sharing partnerships we've entered into, um, including with Access Radio. So we like to give our content away if people can find a different audience than we can with it. So. Um, that's worked really well in terms of bringing more diverse audiences to us and helping organisations, both commercial and non-profit, to kind of serve their audiences better. So in that spirit, um, uh, we'd like to have a chat. And I am open to content coming back and stories coming back because you're right, we, won't, we don't have those voices. <coughs> so happy to, have a, happy, happy to have a chat. Okay, question in the middle. So yes, you, sir. Um, Sure, uh, Cora, and thank you for being here. I, I'd like to dig very briefly in, down into the idea of video storytelling as added value. I think it would be hard to find anybody in this room who would tell you that the, um, the service provided to readers by the New Zealand Herald has improved by the rampant, being improved by the rampant addition of video content to just about everything. I have on my own, uh, so, so occasionally uh, watched the television news from another room and felt moved to run into the room where the screen was so I could actually see the picture on one or two occasions that have brought us in, if that. Um, we know that so much of that video content is file shots, people walking upstairs, um, the shot of somebody fiddling through a filing cabinet to illustrate the fact that a bureaucracy is at work. <laughs> I wonder if in fact there is added value in this and I question, I question whether in the age when, when feature films are being made on cell phones, whether there is next necessarily added value to be had in a public broadcast that's worked in an audio medium going into a video medium or whether an enormous amount of money is not going to be was wasted in creating the platform without a great improvement in content delivery. I wonder, if, in fact, if it all sounds a hell of a lot better than it is. Um, no, good comments. And one distinction I would make compared with how perhaps a, a publisher, publishing company might develop videos, a lot of those video strategies are to generate revenue off advertising. So we wouldn't have that problem. So we could approach it differently. Um, we would also approach it in a way where our core competency around audio storytelling online, on demand and live wouldn't be affected because we know that's um, pivotal. And if you look at what we've done with our very first steps into a more audio visual program with Checkpoint with John Campbell, it's grown its radio audience even as it's got these new people coming to us um, online to watch it and on demand. So I think that shows his way through. But for me, it depends on the audience you're trying to get and the story you're trying to tell. If it's just a series of file clips uh, or people walking upstairs or just sort of generic footage to support a news story, we wouldn't be interested in that. If it's Kim Hill in, in a studio doing a groundbreaking interview um, with someone who's really interesting, uh, that could be quite compelling viewing as well as compelling listening, but we would choose our moments. So I think it does down, come down to quality. Um, what we've seen with Checkpoint is the video we produce out of that show, and it's at a really beginning level, but it's, you know, it's worked really well, is that that travels into different audiences, particularly more diverse audiences on platforms like Facebook. So what we're trying to get there is our traditional audiences are still getting what they expect from us, but new audiences are coming to that material in different ways, and we think that's a sweet spot for us. But I do agree, if we were to throw all our eggs into a video basket to think that was some kind of nirvana, we'd be nuts. But new audiences on new platforms and new forms of storytelling will be drawn to us if we get this right. And the other point I'd make is, you know, we have a really large national newsroom, and some of that high-quality video will come out of the regions, and so it should, and those stories aren't being told at the moment. So I hope that gives you some comfort. And I think, you know, as, as we think about this, we think about the same things. Sorry, can I just follow up and just say... V very quickly, please. Does that apply also to the public service broadcasting television that is on, on, in the long term? 
Uh, isn't, I wonder if that's not, we're more, not mourning for an opportunity that we lost a long time ago, and it's impossible to restore it by, the, by some sort of public service broadcasting channel, yeah. because that, that horse is bothered. Yeah, well, I'd challenge that, mm -hmm. um, absolutely, um, and, and say that the concept of the public sphere, the public space, um, and is is a uh, is a, is a very very live issue in our um, and I'm going to use the phrase networked society, uh, where fragmentation, uh, fake news, um, uh, you know, d the digital divides, um, um, the disenfranchisement of a younger generation. Um, is occurring where uh, diversity is is not being valued um, and talked about, uh, and where the, and and going back to the the notion of a public sphere, where is the trusted place? Where is the um, where is the the sense of? Uh, and I, I think you you know used the the phrase well, sovereignty. Where is that? And, and I think in, in the countries that, um, that we can compare ourselves to, which of, ma of many of which are European countries, that concept of the public sphere is a very live thing. And it's not something that, that is hearkened heart heart for, the, you know, for a past generation. It's actually incredibly important. <coughs> so that's why, you know, linear television is a part of that discussion it's got to be but it's got to be you know where where did, where is the trusted place and that's what I'm trying to drive more of a discussion around in this country about why that's so important and and why we've and why it's urgent and why it's ne necessary for our national sense of nationhood and self and not just for us but for um, the generations coming through so question here, question today. Yeah, hi, as I drive around the country, the, um, I always hear something on the radio, and often that's not only New Zealand. It's when you go out to the provinces, you can hear lots of stations very clearly. Mm -hmm. Radio New Zealand is a bunch of hissy snow. Mm -hmm. That even counts in places like Auckland, which I find astonishing. Um, I would have thought that for RNZ National or RNZ Concert that if I'm in an area where I can hear a station well, I should be able to also hear RNZ National and RNZ Concert well. Yeah. Um, is there a commitment, a drive for, to make sure the coverage, basically to beef up the existing translators, to uh, extend the reach and put in new translators where there's absolutely no reach at the moment, especially in areas where you can pick up a station, e.g. radio, um, media works. It's, yeah, that, that drives me nuts, and that's all I can hear. Um, are we going to get nationwide coverage? Yeah, look, uh, we, across our various networks, we cover about 90% of the uh, New Zealand population. Um, that's across AM and FM. Uh, we probably do need to invest in some FM, we think, particularly in growth areas. I'm interested in Auckland. We've got pretty good services here. So it might be something that's to do with where you're driving. I don't know. Sorry, it's Walkworth. Oh, work, Walkworth. Sorry. Oh, no. Well, I can certainly ask about that. So look, we've got good coverage. Um, we haven't invested in any significant new FM transmission in a number of years for obvious reasons because of funding. Part of our new thinking is that we would be able to boost some FM and we're maintaining AM even as we do that as well. So um, we'll do our best. Uh, it's great also that people can get us online now and through broadband. So you know, it's great that we've got about nine, nine ways you can get us, including on Freeview and Sky. So we're certainly doing our best. Okay, there's David and Ben at the back. Just really four step. If you drive over Bombay Hill, you lose it between hills. There's a bit where you lose it. And if you drive along Bombay Hill, it's a whole big stretch. Yeah. yeah. Actually, let, let's, let's just have a quick show of hands for the people in the room. How many of you sometimes find that you can't actually pick up RNZ? Auckland to Fongaray, no good. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think that's just become an issue on the agenda. <laughs> Um, so we had, a, we had a question from, from David here, and then we had a question from the gentleman at the back, and then in the corner. Kia ora. I'm David Jacobs. I'm a trustee of the Public Media Trust, and so um, over the past 12 years I've been running the Outlook for Sunday project, which is a project for young people uh, creating content, uh, films on, on public issues in the public 
of, of interest. Um, for me, sitting under some of the conversation that's been going on here today has been the question of to what extent uh, RNZ Plus is uh, going to be a, a receiver and commissioner and publisher of content coming to it from the outside, uh, as, as well as a producer of content. And, and for me, I'm particularly interested in two strands there. One is uh, independent voices from the independent production se sector, and for that to grow beyond uh, the, the reach of existing independent filmmakers um, in, in terms of creating public media content. And secondly, um, the, um, the Minister's mentioned uh, uh, public participation in debate, and, and um, Paul, you've mentioned uh, um, uh, um, um, citizenship. In, in, what, in, in what you were saying, sorry, I'll keep this brief. But, um, but both the independent sector and the access and participation um, sector and also that overall concept with, with how a public broadcaster can be in the 21st century as opposed to just information, education and entertainment with a more two-way, multi-theme. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm finishing my question. That's, that's my question, is how much we, we're going to receive from the outside. Sure. Um, well, we're working through our plans at the moment, and it includes uh, quite a significant component of being able to commission material from the production, independent production sector. We think that's really important to stimulate new types of storytelling and innovate in a way that we don't want to do in house. So, um, invest, if the investment is sufficient, we see that as an integral part of what we want to do. And I think that'll be a real boost for us. We do a little bit of it at the moment, it works really well, but we just haven't been able to do enough. So to answer your first bit of the question, that's an element of our thinking, if we're in a position to actually put the thinking into practice. Now, your other question's really interesting, which is really reflecting on the fact we've gone from an age of mass media where just everything went out and everyone just had to receive it, and that was it, to a more of a, a world where you can interact with people, where you can have relationships, um, and actually get content flowing all ways. Um, I'm really interested in that. I think it's going to be a critical ingredient for any media company in future and I think particularly for any public service media organisation. What we've tried to do is form strategic partnerships with the likes of the Access Radio Community, Pacific Media Network, the Iwi Radio Network. We've got good partnerships with all those people and that's about exchanging content and exchanging people and ideas and helping each other. Uh, I think one of the roles of a stronger RNZ is to stimulate and foster some of that strength across the sector. Um, because it's really hard otherwise to see how some of those different voices will survive. So I think uh, we've shown that we're committed to collaboration and partnerships, and it's a key element in future, and um, certainly what you're saying does resonate with me. And can I just make a quick comment there? Because um, in, in the original policy that drove this in, um, before the election, we, we were very clear around um, the ability to, as Paul has said, the ability to increase in-house production and distribution of New Zealand content <coughs> as resources allow, the ability to commission external production from its own resources, and also the ability to acquire offshore program material that conforms to its charter, of which there is, um, and I'm not an expert in this, but that there is likely um, you know, a lot of content that could be being shown on, um, in New Zealand that, it, that never gets anywhere near New Zealand because it doesn't fit within a commercial model. Some of that we see on Netflix, um, um, Lightbox, um, you know, coming in, whether it's, you know, and I'm going to use an example here, a, a, a personal preference, which, you know, completely ignore me, um, Paul, <laughs> But um, is, you know, for instance, Scandinavian, um, some of the quality stuff coming out of Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I, if you want to think about what the, some, that some of those countries have done in the last few years when they've thought about their national identity and their sense of the public sphere, and we're not just talking news and current affairs here, we're talking quality content that reflects who they are and some of the issues of the day. Um, and how they can be transformed into incredible programming, um, uh, drama, whatever, um, is that they've invested in writing, um, in, in, in writing, and Finland, I think, is a good example of that. 
Um, and where that has been put, you know, there's been um, a real emphasis put on quality writing as being uh, an export uh, quality. And you know, and, and you know, moving away to the bigger picture again, which is where I'm trying to take us, because we need to have these discussions and debates. Where, what is it that New Zealand could be doing more of um, to, to put ourselves, not just to reflect us, our, our sense of who we are back to each other, but out to the world more? Um, why can't we be thinking um, uh, bigger than we are now. Why aren't we? Why haven't we allowed ourselves to? And you know, as someone who lived in Australia for 14 years, and you know, for better or worse, um, but experienced what it's like to live in a country where there is quality public service media, where there has been a value put on it, um, we haven't got that here. So we don't know what it's like. Um, and and hopefully we will. Mm. Okay. Question at the back, gentleman with the beard. Yeah, you were first. I'm Laurie Taylor from uh, the old days of uh, Friends of Concert FM. That's a little while ago. <laughs> but the important part is that the funding for public radio hasn't really improved ever since then. And they're making do, they're, they're scratching around to get the bottom of the barrel because that's all they can get with the government providing us with only as much as we are, they are, consider we are worth and affording. We get the poorest um, television because we get what's, what we can afford. Uh, we, get, we occasionally get a first line um, show, we occasionally get a second line show, but most of the stuff we get is rubbish from America, yes. which is just one level yeah. above uh, uh, porn. Um, and, I, and I'm horrified to see the children who I know who listen to this rubbish and they are developing American accents. Yeah, we need more money in the system and we need it soon. Thank you. Do you want to respond? <laughs> Was that a question? I, I mean, I, you know, yes. <laughs> Wait, qu question in the corner. Do, do, you, do you have um, strategies or thinking around protecting this work in the new commission from a change in government? Because yes. National did their very best to strangle RNZ to death and very nearly succeeded. What, what will happen? Like, there are things that you can do to protect this work. What's your thinking around that? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Uh, yes. Um, it, it, so that's why I, I suppose I'm asking um, the public to be patient, that we can't make major transformations overnight, and that when we make, when we we are transforming, that it is that there is sustainability, that there is resilience. That's why I'm using those phrases, because um, you can never completely inoculate from future change. But what I want to do is to put a um, a greater value on the importance of the public sphere for, for investment in public media. And to do that, creating, that's the reason, you know, and I've, you know, I've been asked over and over again um, in the last six months, what on earth is this public media funding commission? Uh, well, it's basically the ability to um, protect, provide a framework for protection for public media that is sanctioned by Parliament and that reports to Parliament. Um, we have um, the environment, which has a commissioner for the environment, um, which provides independent reporting. We have the Ombudsman, which reports on public information. And of course, we need to do more in those spaces as well. But at least we have areas that have a sanctioned um, means of having those public discussions and debates, and that has um, and and has a has a role within our um, within our framework. That is one way, and um, uh, plus, I think a longer term discussion on the funding, the need on the nature of the funding for public media, um, what is an appropriate level of funding, 
what are the appropriate ways of doing that funding. We are yet to have those discussions properly as well. So there's a question here, then a question there, then another question there, and then another question there. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to remind the audience, I think, that the iPhone was only invented 10 years ago. <clears throat> and you must try and imagine what this industry is going to be like in 10 years' time. It's going to experience such change. My, my question is uh, around kids. My, children and grandchildren do not watch live TV. Mm -hmm. They spend their whole time watching recordings which have normally come out of YouTube and they are mostly made in America. So that's a challenge for us for you to find a way through that so that New Zealand content that you were talking about is going to be accessible by our children. The second thing is that I am no longer listening to Radio New Zealand Live. I listen to podcasts all the time. The one thing that I love that you've just done in the last few days, I get up in the morning, I walk out to my bedroom <laughs> and I say, Alexa, play me the news. And I've got this device that plays me the latest Radio New Zealand news. If I'm there at about seven, it plays the seven o'clock news. It's bloody marvellous. So these are the sort of changes that are happening that are going to cause these people to really have to think hard. Do you have a comment? Uh, just on the, um, the fact that a lot's going to happen in the next 10 years and we probably don't even see the beginnings of what that might look like. I think what won't change is talent and sure. great storytelling, great writing, which the Minister's <coughs> talked about, um, strong independent journalism. Um, th those are the touchstones <coughs> that'll see us through the change around platforms and algorithms and all the other things that will happen and that should be the priority it should be investing in the talent and the storytelling and then you guys will decide how you want it um, and it'll be in a, an, a number of ways so RNZ's way through that is to focus on the work itself and think about firstly the audience then about the content which will resonate with the audience and we think about distribution and platform last and our viewers just be everywhere we can afford to be and nice to hear you using Alexa. So um, we've got that working, which is great. Okay. Did you want to come in, Claire? Or should we move? I'll oh, keep so? moving. I, um, thank okay. you. Um, so, sorry, this, this gentleman in the middle. Uh, Minister, you, thank you for talking about writing. Uh, it was very heartening to hear. Um, Radio New Zealand Drama Department closed down two years ago. Um, and I came out late, but as part of the money is going towards this hoping that department again. Um, <laughs> I'm not commenting on that at this oh, point in time. Um, yeah, uh, not quite right to say it closed down, but it's certainly gone to a very base level and, and, and very little commissioning. Yeah, very little commissioning, but we've still got a drama team, they're still doing work right. within our podcast team. But no, it has been one of the decisions that we took um, after nine years of, of frozen funding. Um, we would see some opportunity to develop that if, if increased funding comes our way. Um, and it's a question of priorities for us, us at the moment. We've had to put it down the pecking order, but we'd keep an open mind in future. Okay. Uh, Annie, then here, and then... Kia ora I'm Annie Goldson, I'm both an academic and a filmmaker, and um, it was really, Minister, your comment on the writing and on drama that made me think about the New Zealand Film Commission and the relationship of these quite powerful, well-funded institutions, TVNZ too, of course, but also the New Zealand Film Commission, which has been the home of drama, primarily. Um, I'm someone who's been funded by both New Zealand and the Air for a long time, which meant I had to negotiate sometimes uncomfortably with the commercial broadcasters before I could get my work made. So I have worked with more towards the Film Commission. But, you know, like free-to-air broadcast, um, box office was also undergoing a huge shift because of kind of digital shift. So I wondered if you are talking about writing, if you are talking about multi-million dollar <coughs> scandy series, you know, is there any proposal to talk more collaboratively with the Film Commission? Because that is a model that, for example, exists with Channel 4 and 4 Films. It exists more in Australia than it does in New Zealand, where we've had these kind of separate orbits. So I wondered if there was any, you know, shift towards yeah. thinking about institutional collaboration with creatives. 
Um, yes, from my perspective, yes. I'm, uh, I'm not the Minister for Culture and Heritage who happens to be the Prime Minister, but there are four ministers um, with responsibilities in that whole culture um, and heritage space. The Prime Minister myself is broadcasting. Um, the Minister of Finance, who happens to be the Minister of Sport and also have an associate culture and heritage role, and also um, Minister Cipollone, Carmel Cipollone, who has a role in that as well. This government is placing a very important emphasis on, um, on our culture and heritage. Uh, the, um, I'm also, you know, my other hat is another one of my hats is um, digital, anything to do with digital, which is, of course, the crossover um, that is happening. So yes, I guess, is the answer to that. Um, there is a, this, um, um, there's a 10-year plan being developed for film in New Zealand at the moment. There has to be um, a crossover discussion with, um, with broadcasting and, um, and you know, our media environment on that. Uh, and, and we need to ensure, because, I mean, ultimately, um, people are watching more and more content and they're watching television content on this. It may be saved television content, it may be content that's embedded in, it might be in YouTube, it might be embedded in Facebook or whatever. Um, what I'm bringing this discussion back to is, the, is, the, is a trusted public sphere. And that is what is, has, has, has largely been missing in New Zealand um, and neglected. And that is where um, where where do you go? Where do you know what you're what you're watching is real? Um, uh, where do you go to know that it's actually um, it, it's the essence of our talent? Um, where do you go because people are talking about it and they know, and it, and it's great stuff that's coming out, whether it's being funded from the film commission or being funded through New Zealand on air or coming from RNZ. Um, those are the sorts of questions I think we'll be asking ourselves um, in the future. But I, I guess the short answer is yes, collaboration is, is a hallmark of this government. Okay, gentlemen at the front, um, we're moving into our final phase now, so please let's keep any questions to the, uh, you know, to the point. Hi, I'm Dan Salmon, I'm a director and producer. Um, and as a director and producer, I'm sort of riddled with anxieties about the idea of a new uh, of RNZ Plus as a new television delivery service that may well rob the one the existing one we have that delivers to half a million people at prime time. But at the same time, I really want to get behind the idea of RNZ Plus, but I don't have a clear sense of exactly what it's going to look like for us as an independent industry and for us as consumers. So I just wondered if you both could maybe give me a brief elevator pitch of what it might feel like <laughs> to us. So we can then get in behind it. <laughs> I can go first. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, it will be a progression. For RNZ, it won't be the end game. It'll be a range of things that we want to do. And anything we invest in, we'd want to make it sure it's available on multiple platforms. Um, and we would look very much at stimulating good relationships with the production sector to tap into their expertise rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. So it's, it's very early and I just don't have enough information about our funding trajectory or exactly the expectations that will flow from that. But I would expect in the next few months to be able to give you an even, or a clearer elevator pitch than I can at the moment. Um, I'd go back to what I said before. Um, we know Kiwis are still watching television 86% of them, average of three hours a day. I think there's an opportunity over, sorry? What's the demographic of that 86%? Rest times. Uh, it, would be, it would be older New Zealanders, definitely, but not, not exclusively. And it's still 86% of people are still spending that time, and so there are younger demographics there as well. But in the end, it's just another platform, and we'd want to be on there if we can be. Sorry, that's longer than an elevator pitch. <laughs> now, I'm not going to add to that, but can I ask you a question? What, what, are you, what, what is the fear behind that question? The, the fear for me is as an audience. 
chair that's that we have it's eyeballs we well it's sort of karen's point that we have a publicly owned uh tv is publicly owned and it's this big campfire that's burning a strange color at the moment but we can change that color and all gather around it as a as a people and by creating a new campfire and trying to bring people to that how do we ensure that's a success in the broad of the broadcasting so that we're not ending up with yet another seven, six and seven that cannibalises one and we go, we've devalued one and we don't have anything really to replace it. So that's, that's it in a nutshell for me really. And to, in an industry that has seen massive reductions in real budgets over the last two decades uh, and, and the cost of that and the impact of that on long form programming has, has, has been a, a quality of content and as well as a, at times, a, a big drop off of the people able to make that type of programming. Um, how do we ensure that that doesn't continue to continue within something that's trying to lift the bar for all of us? Okay. So I think we're down to our last two questions. So there's a gentleman over here and a lady over here. Thank you. Uh, the one thing I did notice here is that uh, there's an absence of frenzy gabbling from the table. Now I say that because uh, I'm uh, not sure as to whether the Minister of Broadcasting has, it, has control over broad, broadcasting in the, in the hun whole country as a whole, but what concerns me is that we seem to be developing a culture right throughout society which is based on the, on the frenzy gabbling that comes out on, the, on commercial television, uh, commercial, commercial radio, and we can understand why, because every minute is worth, worth thousands of dollars, and so and the more that can be said within that time, the, the more money that's to be made. But, that's a, but this is at, the, is at the cost of, it's causing a, uh, to my mind, it's, it's causing a change in our culture where where we never pause between, what the, between the words we say to give time for what's said to be sink in, to sink in. It's a bit like even uh, <coughs> popular music, when one piece of music finishes, the next one started before the first one's finished. And this is, this is, this is right throughout the whole of the broadcasting system and, and in the uh, television. And it's a tendency which is going to have a very bad effect on our society. I ask that question. Well, I don't know about control, but can I? Uh, I was actually just reading about this um, the other day because um, I went and had a look at what Noam Chomsky had to say on the concept of concision. Um, look, I see a few academics nodding their heads. Um, I'll get a few brownie points for that, um, which is really that that you know, in between commercial breaks, that you've only got the opportunity to say. A, you know, a couple of things, which is why conventional ideas take root and there's very little challenging of them because of the ad breaks. Um, Non-commercial, public media is what we are talking about here today and it has a real value and uh, we need more of it. Yeah. Well, so, sorry, sir, we're going to have to move on. Last question. My so. question is for the Minister. What do you intend to do for the people that are, you mentioned diversity, and it's a big issue for yep. many people. And one of the things that I found, and as I've looked at over the last 50 odd years that I've lived in New Zealand, that has greatly disappeared, is that as more and more there seem there would appear to be a story is only worth a story, provided it has some commercial value. If it has no commercial value, then it doesn't. Nobody's interested. And I think largely that occurs in a lot of cases, far too many. And what I would think it, that I would hope that the the new RNZ plus system would be more able to ignore that commercial aspect and make and allow people that are different, right. diverse, yes. whatever, so, to have a 
to be worthy of being listened to. Absolutely. Look, the ethos of RNZ has always been diversity. And, but it has been um, neglected. It has transformed itself within that framework of neglect into, a multi, into multimedia platforms. Um, but it has done that at a cost because of frozen funding and neglect. But in my view, and Paul, you may have a comment to make, the ethos of RNZ has always been to um, provide that non-commercial voice that reflects New Zealand and allows the ability for critical analysis and quality um, that is not seen or heard on other platforms. Yeah, my, my comment there is that I spent more than 10 years trying to, <laughs> to get the message across and get diversity included and largely nobody's interest. That's so, what we would Paul like to make a brief comment? And this will have to be the wrap-up. We, um, we're all about our commercial-free public service media. Um, and we do a decent job of reflecting a wide view of society with different voices. Um, we're not perfect. We are constrained by resourcing, of course. But a bigger, stronger, more multi-RNZ will be able to do more in the areas you've highlighted and we will never be commercial. So we will actually do programming, news and current affairs that stimulates the sharing of information and the building of community as an end in itself because we don't have to sell the audience for ratings, so, through ratings. So I think those, those cornerstones are there and if we can do more, you should see a really positive difference. Okay, well we're going to have to wrap up on that point. But a very, very big thank you to the Honourable Claire Curran and also to Paul Thompson. And thank you very, very much to you, the audience, for coming along. I guess there was nothing on TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay, big round of applause for everyone.